Good morning. People steal cuttings, I encourage them. That's really important today. Good morning, thank you very much for coming. We are extremely appreciative of you showing such an interest in the launch of a very particular opportunity for people to involve themselves in something we think is very special. Artists live in houses and make work in them. They make work in other people's houses too. There are countless plaques on countless walls across the globe running to catch up with the trail of inspired moments down the ages. Here he wrote such and such. Between the years blank and blank, she completed so and so. He lived here, she boarded here. Even for a week, a night, they slept here. Artists also work on the bus, in trains, in cafes, and on the sides of roads, under trees and canvas, and bedclothes by torchlight. Let's maybe conclude that art is generated everywhere. This idea flicks a beautiful switch, in my view. It de-exoticizes and brings closer the idea of artists' work, rubs it into the landscape of regular lived human life. This is closer to an accurate picture, in my view, as I know it to be. Artists, writers, painters, sculptors, filmmakers, performers, musicians, philosophers, make work within our lived days and in between the doorways of a social mortal span. It would be impossible to catch, therefore, like a butterfly in a net, every sight of every artist's creative inspiration. Let's just say that might be the world itself, after all. But there are some places that represent something worth preserving, not in fact simply because they represent a past point in history and a footnote regarding a single life once lived, but because of the influence that they had on that life, the working practice they made possible, the liminal energy they afforded and might still afford, open souls seeking their nourishment. I first saw Prospect Cottage the day that Derek did. We had driven down to find a bluebell wood to shoot in. I had remembered a wide bluebell expanse in Kent from my school days there. We potted down in my ramshackle little car and found the idyll now covered in concrete. A little disheartened, we headed for the coast, abandoning bluebells in search of fresh air. Derek's father had recently died and left him a small inheritance. Life on Charing Cross Road had become somewhat overstimulating and Derek was looking for a place to be quieter. He had a friend who lived on the shingle at Dungeness, that pocket of southern England that sounded to me so tantalizingly Scottish. The dangerous nose, they call it, the fifth quarter of the globe. We drove along the shore road and stopped to skim flat stones like flints into the waves, pocket a few pebbles that we found with perfect holes in them, little knowing that this would be the first of a thousand afternoons for us spent in much the same way. As we were turning to drive back to London, we saw at the same moment a small black painted wooden house with yoke yellow window frames on the left-hand side of the road facing the sea. It had a for sale sign stuck in the stones at its feet. I remember distinctly turning it without a word and stopping the car. We knocked on the door, were let in by the charming lady who lived there, and after a tour that cannot have lasted longer than 15 minutes, were back on the road heading north. Derek decided before we reached Lid that he would buy it. And within a couple of months was taking down chintz curtains and prizing open the lid of the first of gazillion gallons of pitch black paint with which to anoint his new kingdom. The pleasure he took in transforming this modest bungalow into the TARDIS he created, the setting for his films, his books, his garden, the solace of the sea, and the peculiar glamour of the nuclear power station especially at the moment at which he discovered himself ill, was incalculable. He made of this wee house, this, I was just thinking, this is like a wooden tent that he pitched in the wilderness, an artwork, and out of its shingle skirts, an ingenious garden, now internationally recognized. But first and foremost, the cottage was always a living thing, a practical toolbox for his work. You will quite properly be hearing today that we're seeking to save, to preserve a treasure that might otherwise be lost to our cultural landscape. I would like to take my opportunity of speaking here to propose that we're not seeking to set in a time warp a precious object of historical significance for posterity only. 
but crucially to resuscitate and ensure the continued vibrational existence of a living battery, to clear space around it and feed the energy of a resource that was only ever intended to be that. This is a vision not of taking, but of giving. Just as Derek was self-determinately dedicated to process above product, to collective work, to empowering voices that might feel alienated, my excitement about this vision for Prospect Cottage lives in its projected future as an open, inclusive and encouraging machine for the inspiration and functional working lives of those who might come to share in its special qualities. Qualities that, as a young artist, I was lucky enough to benefit from alongside Derek and so many of our friends and fellow travellers. Beyond the plaques, there are some places that offer the vision of a continued evolution as a point of encouragement and metaphysical enlightenment. I suggest that Prospect Cottage is such a place. Derek memorably said that he would prefer his works after his death to evaporate and disappear. For what it's worth, and in honor of the supremely contrary nature of my friend, I feel fully confident that he would be extremely enthusiastic about the generosity of this vision for the continuance of the life of his beloved Prospect Cottage, so well named, as a possibility for future artists, thinkers, activists, gardeners to gain from it the practical and spiritual nourishment it lent him and for which he was and is eternally grateful. Thank you.